Well, good afternoon and welcome to uh, this afternoon's uh, Baptist Union Support Services uh, uh, webinar. Uh, it's great to have, have you with us. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Caroline Sanderson, our Legal Services Manager. Hi there, Caroline. Hello. Uh, we're going to be talking today about uh, charitable incorporated organisations, uh, which is a, a legal structure that many Baptist churches are exploring. Uh, this is an update of a webinar we did in, or Caroline did in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, the law hasn't changed since then, but but we've got a lot more experience. So um, uh, I'm going to put Caroline's slides up for us to get started. Um, if you have questions, uh, then uh, please do put them in the YouTube chat feed. Um, we will see we'll, we'll take a bit of a call as to whether to deal with them there and then or to or to hold a few to the end um but uh caroline will uh, will press on and give us her content but as i say do do feel free to put uh questions in the chat and uh we will we will deal with them uh before we finish um but it, it's always good to have your questions and because that's often some of the most interesting uh, content comes out of the questions so uh, caroline uh over to you uh tell us all about CIOs. Great, thanks Richard. Hi everybody, good to have you on this webinar today. Um, as Richard said, this is a refresh of the 2018 webinar, so a lot of it um, is similar content, um, but if you have seen that webinar and you're just wondering about the updates, there's just a few bits as I go along and I'll flag those up to you as I go along. So, um, CIO structure is something that we discuss regularly with churches and there may be a number of reasons why you are thinking about exploring it for your church or perhaps a project you're running. When we speak to churches often we ask churches about their risk profile and what I mean by that are what are the key um, areas of church life and activities that you undertake regularly that could be um, potential causes for difficulties. So for example, do you have um, a number of employees as well as your minister? Do you have a number of activities that bring visitors onto your church premises? All of those sorts of things can be risk factors uh, for the church and uh, managing that risk. Do you have concerns about your personal liability if you're a trustee? Or perhaps you may be struggling as a church to even recruit trustees uh, because it's been a concern for members of your church about legal liability. It may be that you've heard of other local churches in your association or even in your local area in your town that have become CIOs recently and you might be thinking that it's something that you should explore for yourselves. Um, in the last year or so, you will have heard the BU talking about the end of the accepting regulations. Uh, and I will come on to that in some detail later on, um, but that might have been uh, a trigger for you to consider your own governance structures and, and charity registration. Perhaps your church is undertaking a development project which can uh, involve entering into some sizable uh, contracts with third parties and developers, and that um, might be a risk that you're thinking about mitigating by becoming a CIO. Maybe you're not even here in a church context. Perhaps you are joining this webinar because you are a pioneer or you're thinking uh, about setting up a separate mission or community and uh, a CIO might be a structure you would want to think about from the outset of that project. And of course, there may be a host of other reasons, um, but uh, I'll hopefully uh, be able to answer a number of questions uh, on these areas as we go through uh, the webinar today. So what I'll be looking at today is a basic introduction to Baptist church governance and charity registration. And then I'll be looking a bit more uh, in detail at the CIO constitution and uh, the structure itself. And why in more detail you might want to change to the CIO structure if you're already uh, a Baptist church, but an unincorporated association church. We'll look a little bit at the process of incorporation as a CIO, the steps you'll have to go through uh, from start to finish. And then I'll talk a little bit around uh, property trusts, the special trusts that often a number of our churches have in place for the church property, particularly the church building. And then I'll wrap up with some final thoughts before we have some questions at the end. Uh, a recording of this webinar will be available on the Bugby website. Uh, all of the support services webinars are available at that uh, link there forward slash webinars. So you can come back to it as many times as you like uh, and share it with your fellow trustees uh, or other church members. 
So I hope you know that all of our Baptist churches are charities in their own right, and that's because they are established for the advancement of religion, the Christian faith, and also they have a public benefit um, and they meet for public worship. Now, some of our churches have already registered with the Charity Commission. Uh, Charity Commission requires churches where your income is over £100,000 a year to register with the Charity Commission. So a number of you may already be registered charities, but still the majority of our churches are unregistered, unincorporated churches, but all still charities. So the accepting regulations is what applies to our churches which are unregistered where their income is less than £100,000. And there was um, an extension to the accepting regulations which were due to expire in uh, earlier this year, at the end of March 2021. But uh, the Charity Commission in consultation with government, with DCMS, agreed a further 10-year uh, extension which was approved by Parliament earlier this year. So that means churches which are unincorporated, where the income is less than £100,000, don't need to be worrying about having to register with the Charity Commission at this stage. However, the good news is if you wanted to register, there's no minimum income threshold for CIOs. So that means that irrespective of your income, if you wanted to be a registered charity, you could do so by becoming a CIO. And obviously that's with the Charity Commission. It's really important for all of our churches, irrespective of size and uh, whether you're um, you know, undertaking a huge number of activities or otherwise, to have a comprehensive governing document, which we would ordinarily call a constitution. It's important for all modern charities to have one of those, just to enable you to sort of set out the framework for your governance arrangements and to make sure that you're clear with what decisions need to be made and how and when, uh, and things like church members' meetings. In 2008, we prepared for charity registration and developed our own Baptist approved governing document, which was for unincorporated Baptist churches when it became compulsory for churches with that income of £100,000 or more to have to register. And that approved governing document reflects uh, Baptist church uh, governance and uh, our established patterns of um, meetings and, and worship and, and appointment of trustees and the like. The Charity Commission were happy with our document because it, was in, it enabled us to identify who the charity trustees would be in our churches and those are those people who have the legal and financial responsibility as well as um, details around church members meetings. And when we did a review a few years ago of our approved governing document for our unincorporated churches, we felt, and the consultation that we did um, came back positively, and people felt that the, that approved governing document has been working well. But of course, that does leave us still with the challenge of personal liability for our charity trustees in our churches. And indeed, even because of um, the nature of Baptist church congregational governance, there is also a risk to church members uh, where our churches have an unincorporated structure. So the CIO was helpful in addressing that particular point. And the CIO structure has really been available since around 2013. And again, similarly to our uh, approved governing document for our unincorporated churches, we developed um, a constitution for our Baptist churches. And the key thing with the CIO is that it offers protection from personal liability. Uh, I should point out that that doesn't mean to say that, you know, charity trustees of a CIO would be um, exonerated from anything uh, that were to arise. If there's a breach of trust or if trustees don't act in good faith, then, of course, a personal liability may still arise. The benefit of a CIO is that uh, whilst it is a corporate structure, it only reports to the charity commission. It doesn't have to report to company's house, unlike a company limited by guarantee structure. The Charity Commission has two model constitutions for CIOs. There is a foundation model and an association model. And the model which our Baptist document is based upon is the association model. And this is because the association model provides for a wider membership beyond the charity trustees themselves, which of course is appropriate for a Baptist church context, because in our Baptist churches, of course, we have congregational governance and our Baptist church members meetings are um, involved in the decision making uh, for, the, for the life of the church and the activities of the church. So using that association model template, 
we came up with uh, our solicitors with a bespoke Baptist approved governing document for CIOs. And again, it reflects Baptist patterns and principles. The little snippet that you've got on the side of the screen there is just a, a glimpse of it. But actually, if you have already adopted the unincorporated governing document for churches, then the CIO document is going to look pretty familiar for you because it reflects um, much of the same content of our uh, 2008 approved governing document. Um, but of course, there are some additional things in it that were, are required by the CIO regulations. What we've discovered in the last uh, few years since we've been encouraging churches to consider adopting the CIO constitution is that this document can also be readily uh, used uh, for pioneering projects or churches that are doing something uh, that doesn't look quite like, you know, your normal established Baptist church context. Um, and our approved governing document has been used. Uh, by pioneers and some missional community projects successfully and has been registered with the Charity Commission. Um, but if you are thinking along those lines, then I would encourage you to have a conversation uh, with Justine Higgin or myself in the legal and operations team so that we can talk to you about any amendments that you might uh, like to consider, how we can tweak that document to make it fit your context, which isn't necessarily what we would um, expect in a, in a normal church context, uh, so do get in touch. But we have found that that's been working well. This year, we actually updated the CIO approved governing document because having had our experience throughout the pandemic of um, holding church meetings online, we felt it was important to ask the Baptist Union Council uh, to consider um, us amending our approved governing documents, both for unincorporated churches and our CIOs, to allow for electronic meeting provisions to be included. And the BU Council agreed that approach. Um, and so we added some new electronic meeting provisions to both approved governing documents, and they have now been approved uh, by the Charity Commission. Now, I just wanted to say that if you have already got um, a copy of the CIO constitution from our solicitors, Anthony Collins, um, but you got that document some um, perhaps even a year or two ago, before we introduced these new electronic meeting provisions, then I would encourage you to um, have a look at these electronic meeting provisions, because I think it's just really helpful for churches to have those in your document, even if you don't intend to use them or rely on them very often. I think it gives you extra flexibility should the need arise for either hybrid meetings or electronic um, meetings, for example, on, on Zoom. Uh, some churches I know have found it really helpful and liberating to be able to have more people at their church meetings by relying on these electronic provisions. Now, you can get the additional wording uh, for those electronic meeting provisions from our website. If you go to baptist.org.uk forward slash legal and ops, um, then the wording is provided in our December 2020 update but do also contact us if you'd like those uh, and you can't find them on the website. So why would you want to change uh, to become a CIO if you're currently an unincorporated church structure? Well an unincorporated charity doesn't have what we call legal personality or legal status so it can't in and of itself enter into any contracts with third parties, it can't hold property. And so our churches that are unincorporated have to act through the charity trustees, which in a Baptist church contract context, as I'm sure you'll be aware, are your minister, your treasurer, church secretary, deacons, elders, it's your leadership team in short, and they will be your charity trustees, those persons who are taking the day-to-day -day responsibility for the administration and management of your church charity. Now, if you're entering into contracts well, as an unincorporated association charity, invariably the contract will be in the name of your charity trustees. And a CIO means that you could enter into contracts just in the name of the CIO, the church. So it can enter into contracts, contracts directly rather than in the names of the charity trustees. And this might be helpful, for example, when you're entering into some significant new building projects where there might be quite a big financial risk attached um, and other key contracts with third parties, even employment contracts um, or other um, contracts that you might be entering into. It just means that the contract is in the name of the CIO. CIOs can also hold property in their own name, and I will discuss this in more detail as we go through the webinar later, specifically around the, the special property trusts that many of our churches have. 
of course, a CIO can sue and also be sued. So if, unfortunately, there were to be a claim against your church, that claim wouldn't be in the name of your charity trustees. It would actually be in the name of the CIO. Most Baptist church CIOs do leave their property with the Baptist Trust Corporation. So, for example, the Baptist Union Corporation or the London Baptist Property Board or whichever one it may be for your particular church. And I will touch on that in more detail as we go along. Of course, the other key benefit from being a CIO is that protection from personal liability. This can help with trustee recruitment, as I alluded to at the beginning of the webinar. And because of that limitation of liability, it would just hopefully will give um, your trustees some comfort as they enter into arrangements on behalf of the church. I think it probably is fair to say that there is um, uh, an increased uh, litigious culture that we find ourselves in. Uh, certainly, even the last 18 months have raised um, some disputes uh, and other sort of tricky things have emerged. And uh, so I think it's worth thinking about the CIO for future proofing your charity uh, for any potential claims that might arise at any stage. We have some information in our L16 leaflet around legal liability of church members in a Baptist church, which I would suggest you have a look at because it talks through um, the different kinds of liability that can arise in a Baptist church context. Um, and the good thing about a CIO is that the liability of the CIO is limited to the assets of the CIO. But um, the other thing, of course, that you can consider alongside becoming a CIO is insurance. Now, I would expect all of our churches to have um, insurance in place, not just for your buildings, but of course, public liability insurance is absolutely critical. And usually included within your public liability insurance is um, the trustee indemnity insurance policy. And that will cover um, trustees where they uh, where things um, claims are brought or where mistakes have been made in good faith. Um, but the thing with insurance is that there's no, never a, a cast iron guarantee uh, that your insurance is going to cover a particular claim that may arise. Um, perhaps because if you've had a gap in your insurance and, you know, mistakenly fail to insure in a particular year, or um, if your trustees perhaps have underinsured uh, and haven't set the insurance uh, cover uh, at the appropriate level. Uh, for the activities and the risks that you're trying to manage. And of course, you can always have exclusions in, in a contract, uh, an insurance contract. Uh, and so I think it's worth um, making sure that your insurance is um, at the appropriate level as well as considering a CIO. So do take a look at that L16 leaflet, which will be helpful. Many new charities, most new charities now, are established as CIOs um, because it is a structure that is a corporate structure, but it's specifically designed for charities. And companies often are, have a much more business orientated focus and so aren't always what a charity is looking for and certainly not our churches. I would say that we have now approximately 200 Baptist churches that have completed their registration as CIOs, but certainly there's at least 50 more. I think in the pipeline, um, there's a constant stream of churches that are asking for our CIO constitution template. Um, and we're regularly having conversations with churches about whether the CIO structure is right for them at this time. A couple, well, a handful of churches, maybe 20 or so of our Baptist churches are companies limited by guarantee. And that's really because they incorporated uh, with the company structure before the CIO structure was available. So if your church is a company limited by guarantee, then there is a separate process um, which would enable you to convert to a CIO. Um, and we've got some information in our guideline leaflets um, and on the Charity Commission website, but do get in touch if that is your church, um, because certainly it is a simpler uh, structure to be a CIO and not have to worry about reporting to company's house. But not only that, we wouldn't really recommend a CLG, a company limited by guarantee structure for our churches um, now that the CIO structure is available because of things like proxy voting, where someone could attend a Baptist church members meeting without even being a member of the Baptist church and could vote in that meeting. Um, so we would always recommend uh, the CIO structure as a corporate structure for our Baptist churches. Looking uh, briefly at the process of establishing a CIO, you set up uh, the, the CIO by um, agreeing a constitution, you register that CIO with a charity commission, and then you have to think about transferring across your assets, activities and liabilities to the CIO. 
You have to deal with um, assets or funds that are held on special trusts, so that would invariably be the property trusts, um, many of which will be permanent endowments. Um, and then if your church is a registered charity, you might also have to think about closing or linking that old church charity. Um, so those are the kind of, that's the overarching process that you'll have to go through in becoming a CIO. And uh, I would say most churches would do that in about a year from start to finish. So when you establish the CIO, the first thing you'll want to do is get a hold of our Baptist CIO constitution, uh, the approved governing document. And you can get hold of that from Esther Campbell, who is um, an associate solicitor at Anthony Collins, um, you, by just dropping her an email using the email address there. And uh, what you will be asked to do is to agree the terms of a copyright license. Um, so this precedent document is not available on our website, like the unincorporated um, approved governing document. It has to be acquired through um, Anthony Collins. So if you've got another church that's already got the document, please don't uh, borrow it from them. Please do go through this process because the document is available under license free of charge. But we have certain protected clauses within our document that if you wanted to amend them, it would need the consent of the Baptist Union. So uh, that will all be set out for you when you get the document from Anthony Collins. So then you'll want to review the CIO constitution. And as I mentioned earlier, it is very similar to our approved governing document for unincorporated churches. And it's a bespoke Baptist document. So you will find pretty much what you would expect to find in a Baptist church constitution around uh, decision making, appointments and, and such like. Of course, when you um, adopt a new constitution, you will need to put it to your church members meeting for approval. Um, and you might want to have a subcommittee of uh, trustees who look at it in the first instance and make recommendations because there are options within the document, you know, either or options that you will want to go through and choose um, and then put it to your church meeting for a decision to adopt it prior to it being registered with the Charity Commission. When you register your CIO with the Charity Commission, obviously it's an entirely new charity and so it will be uh, given a new charity number and some churches ask solicitors to help them with this whole process to guide them through it but also it is entirely possible for your church to go through this process without involving solicitors at this stage. We've got a leaflet C08 online, uh, the link is there for you and that takes you through the process of doing it on your own without uh, external legal input and uh, by all means do get in touch with us if you're going through that process um, and you don't want to instruct solicitors at that stage we can also um, help you out and you can get to the point of registering your CIO before you need to take formal legal advice. The legal advice will be required at this next stage which is the asset transfer which your churches will need to also consider. And this is where you identify the assets of the church charity, the activities that you undertake, and of course, any liabilities that you definitely don't want to be leaving in the unincorporated structure where you would still have that risk of personal liability. You want to transfer everything effectively over to the new CIO structure. One thing that I would say uh, all churches need to be very careful with is especially, I mean, it won't apply if you're not in the Baptist pension scheme, but if you are in the Baptist pension scheme, please do be aware of creating a pension cessation event. If you are going to set up and transfer your assets to a new CIO, then this could trigger a cessation debt. And it's really important, please, that you have a very early conversation with the pensions team, with either Marshall, Rowan or Steve Caney, the pensions manager, and let them know that you're thinking of becoming a CIO. And there are a number of uh, documents and processes that the Baptist Pension Scheme will need you to go through and to enter into um, in relation to transferring your pension liability to the CIO. Uh, there is information on the Baptist Pensions website, um, but do get in touch with either Marshall or Steve as well, please, in good time. You will also need to consult with other stakeholders. So, for example, if you've been a recipient of a grant, um, if you've got any lenders, whether that's uh, the Baptist Union Loan Fund or uh, any other lenders, you'll need to consider um, your other advisors, pension providers, your insurance, you'll need to be in touch with them and also get in touch with your property trustees, 
banks. Um, you know, banks will often, well, sometimes will require you to open a new bank account, um, which I know will probably, you know, get a few people groaning because uh, we know how difficult it sometimes can be. But actually, what I would say is that banks are now much more familiar with the CIO as a structure than they were a few years ago. And um, different banking providers seem to be taking slightly different approaches. Um, so hopefully you won't have to set up a new bank account, but certainly you need to liaise with banking providers. If you've got tenants using your buildings, uh, or indeed if your church is a tenant in a building, then it would be um, important for you to liaise with um, your tenant or your landlord to let them know that your charity structure is changing. And of course, if you have employees too, then you will need to enter into a consultation with them about the change of legal structure. Although in reality, for that employee, nothing much is going to change. Um, so yes, your solicitors will be able to advise in relation to all of these aspects, but uh, there is some of this uh, additional work to be done, uh, novating contracts and the like. Your leadership team can agree uh, the transfer agreement. That's not necessarily going to need to go to your church members meeting. But at some stage, of course, you will need a special church members resolution to agree uh, the transfer and the uh, well, the setting up the CIO and the transfer of all of the assets over to uh, the new structure. It is really important that you take advice from charity solicitors around this particular aspect of the process, not just your high street firm, because they're unlikely to have a great deal of experience around CIOs um, and certainly not necessarily um, be familiar with, uh, for example, the requirements of our Baptist pension scheme or indeed uh, some of our um, particularly Baptist charitable property trusts. Um, so please do take advice from charity solicitors for this aspect of the process. So you're likely to need specialist legal advice in relation to your property foundation deed, which would be often the big parchment deed that your church uh, was established um, when your church was established and it sets out some of the administrative provisions around um, the church, but also it will identify often what will happen upon closure of the church. And it's important just to make sure that those are looked at as well. There is a process available for your church to transfer um, its property to the CIO, for the CIO to hold that trust property um, on the same trusts and the CIO tra acts as a trust corporation itself. If that's the process that you think you might want to go through, um, there will be a number of consents that you will have to get and you might also need to make some amendments to your trust deeds uh, at the church's expense. I'll spend a bit more time looking at some of the uh, steps that we would take as a Baptist Trust Corporation shortly. The other alternative, of course, is to leave your property and any property trust funds um, on those separate trusts with the existing Baptist Trust Corporation. Um, and the CIO will just be the beneficiary church, just as your church currently is, uh, and where a Baptist Trust Corporation holds um, property and funds on trust for the churches and most churches choose this route. Most churches leave their trust property with their existing Baptist Trust Corporation, whether that's the BUC, Heber, Weber, YBA, uh, the EMBTC or the LBPB. I think that's really because churches understand that there is a benefit to having the bespoke specialist advice that a trust corporation can offer. Um, and of course, the trust corporation is not likely to go anywhere in the future, whereas whilst you might have um, competent, experienced trustees, perhaps even some solicitors on your charity trustee um, team at the moment, that's obviously not always going to be the case. Um, and at least you have a consistent approach by uh, leaving your property with a Baptist trust corporation. If your church did want to transfer its church property to the CIO, to be held by the CIO, there are a number of steps that the Baptist Trust Corporation would want to be assured of uh, and for the church to take. So first of all, we would look at your CIO constitution and we would want to make sure that the CIO constitution um, is reflective of a Baptist church and therefore is in keeping with the Baptist Charitable Property Trust set out in your foundation deed or any model trust that may have been adopted as well. The Baptist Trust Corporation will also want to make sure that there's no current breach of trust um, prior to agreeing any transfer. And of course, it would be important for um, the trustee, the holding trustee, your property trust corporation, to ensure that there are no wider governance or other concerns 
Um, and of course, it's important with the B Baptist Trust Corporation hat on to make sure from our perspective that if the transfer of trusteeship to the church CIO were to go ahead, that that would be in the best interests of the property charitable trusts themselves. So there is no guarantee if you wanted to transfer your trust um, property to your CIO that um, that the trust corporation would uh, immediately agree to it. Um, they would the vast majority of our churches uh, don't intend to transfer their property away uh, from the Baptist Trust Corporation because they see very much the benefit of having the uh, wider expertise provided to them uh, for free. Uh, the ones that really have transferred their property, I have to say, are the majority of churches are ones that actually are no longer in membership with the Baptist Union, where we've been holding the property uh, for historical reasons. If you were to transfer the property, of course, we would look at whether or not there is a Baptist ultimate trust. Uh, for example, when the church closes, does it uh, identify, for example, the Baptist Union or the Baptist uh, Building Fund or some other um, ultimate beneficiary? If that is the case, then there may also need to be restrictions on the land registry title for any transfer. So it's not a straightforward process and uh, it would certainly require additional legal advice and expense at the cost of the church. Just a few final thoughts before we take questions. Uh, I know that you may be thinking, well, this all sounds very positive. Why would we not want to become a CIO? And I would certainly say to you that it's not always right or appropriate for every church to become a CIO. I would say that if uh, you are thinking about it at the moment um, and having listened to this webinar or perhaps discussed, um, you know, whether or not this is right for your church at this time, if you decide that it's not right for your church at this time, that's absolutely fine. It's not for every church, uh, especially if you have assessed that your risk profile is, is such that there's not a huge number of activities or risks um, that would push you towards uh, considering limiting your liability in this way. There are costs, obviously, to setting up a CIO, and we would um, invariably expect uh, the legal fees to be in the region of £3,000 plus VAT. But that, of course, does depend on whether or not you do that first part of the process where you register the CIO on your own or whether or not you take legal advice at that point. Um, but, but you might want to budget for this kind of figure, um, but obviously get a fee estimate from the solicitors you instruct. Um, I did mention briefly that I think the process can invariably take up to a year. It depends on how many church meetings you think you're going to have to have um, and the complexity of the process. Um, if you've got to deal with um, lots of different third parties uh, to innovate contracts, dealing with a pension scheme and the like, it can take a bit of time. And it might be worth you considering um, finding a, a point person to manage this project for you, perhaps one of your trustees or maybe someone from your membership who can take a lead on the project um, so that it doesn't. Um, take uh, time away from uh, ministry. Of course, once you become a CIO, if you're not already a registered charity, then you have to fulfill the reporting requirements of the Charity Commission, regardless of your income. Um, uh, but if you're already a registered charity, you'll be familiar with those uh, requirements already. Um, and finally, as I've mentioned already, of course, there is that uh, potential for triggering a pension cessation event, uh, which you definitely want to avoid. Uh, so do get in touch with the pension scheme in good time. We do have uh, a number of leaflets on our website, which I hope will be useful to you. The ones I would direct you to in relation to becoming a CIO are these three. C11, which deals with churches, charities and incorporation. C808, which is about registering as a CIO online if you want to go through that process um, independently of using solicitors. And there's an additional one, C12, which is about using our CIO approved governing documents. We also um, provide half day CIO training sessions with Anthony Collins solicitors, which we've been doing on Zoom over the last uh, year or so. And it's actually been um, a good way of doing it. We used to travel around to different associations to do our, our, day, our day of trainings, but actually we found it's worked pretty well on Zoom. So it only runs from 10 till one, but we do go into quite a, quite a bit more detail around the process. Um, and uh, that's with Anthony Collins. So if you wanted to find out a bit more, having watched this webinar, um, then do please sign up for one of our half day CIO training sessions. We'll probably be running four next year. Um, so look out for those on our website and in our support services monthly updates. 
Of course, if you have any questions at any stage, please do raise them with us. Uh, you can drop an email to the legal and operations team by emailing legal.ops at baptist.org.uk. That's it from me. Now I'll hand back to Richard to take us through any questions that you may have. Thanks very much. Thanks, Caroline. Um, we've just had our first question. Uh, so it comes from Bearwood Baptist Church uh, and it says, if you're planning to review your church constitution, is that a good time to consider a CIO? Yes, absolutely. I think it's a good time to consider it because if you're planning to review your constitution anyway and you're going to have to go through uh, the hoops of uh, discussing the clauses and uh, certainly if you haven't got the approved governing document, um, then I would say this is definitely a good opportunity to have um, a look at you know, a much more comprehensive fit for purpose document. Um, and it might be that um, the CIO isn't right for you, but I do think that's a helpful trigger to certainly consider the CIO as a model for your church um, if you're going to go through the process of looking at your constitution anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, well, yeah, there's two large lumps to the work, isn't there, really? There's one is getting getting an agreed constitutional you know, detail that you can then register and then the transfer process. And yeah. clearly, if you're going to review the constitution anyway, then that's half the job that you're already going to do, uh, mm -hmm. do in any case. And Richard, so, your church has done it. So, you know, yep. you can no. share how long, how long does it take for your church to do it? Well, we did ours uh, in a sense in two, two chunks because we relatively shortly before becoming a CIO, we, we implemented a, um, the approved governing document for unincorporated churches. And then about three years later uh, became, became a CIO. The CIO, transfer process so once we had the approved governing document transferring the the choices of uh, options in the in the constitution across to uh, across to the cio was was trivial really because the structures yeah. are, are very so very similar yeah, yeah. very yeah and um but the process of transferring everything across to the cio was probably about a year and but by far mm. and away the most difficult part of that was the banking yeah. um, <laughs> Far and away the most yeah. difficult. Um, yeah. my, my one tip for that is is just early engagement with your current banking provider to make sure you understand whether they will be able to transfer the, the account that you already have across to your new entity. And I certainly yeah. know that CAF Bank will do that. Um, I'm not aware of any other banks that do that, but that but that it may be they're becoming more familiar. I certainly know that when we were with Santander and they told us we had to create a new account so um uh, we had we shopped around and actually chose a different different account provider uh, mm -hmm. going forward but uh, yeah i've that heard a mixed a... mixed lot of you know stories from churches some say that their banking providers don't require them to open a new account and others do so yeah no it's quite yeah. it's quite quite a mixed bag um so uh we've got a um a second question in from Penny, Penny Marsh, who is asking, if you're a new church emerging from a pioneering project, uh, do you need to have a bank account in place before registering? Well, for a CIO, there's no minimum income threshold. So I don't think you necessarily need to have a bank account in place. But I think um, it's worth um, having one in place if you're going to be setting up a new entity anyway. Um, but certainly there's no requirement, I think, for you to share um, accounts or um, anything like that because there is no minimum income threshold, uh, which is not the same for other you know, charities that have to have a minimum income threshold of £5,000. Mm. Um, so I, I don't think you have to um, have a bank account, but uh, it would be part of the process. Um, if you did have to, you might just have to put it into the registering as a CIO online document. Do look at CIO8 uh, just to clarify that point. Um, but certainly you don't have to provide any proof of income that's for sure no um I, th I think if you're moving from an existing church uh it's, it's easier to register the constitution first and then of course there's mm. an entity that the the bank can look at on the charity commission register when they're when they're sort of doing all their own sort of identity checks on the um on the um yeah, cio okay. structure so um, yeah. i'd probably advise at least getting the constitution prepared and registered and then doing the banking or setting up the new a bank account if, if you're talking certainly if you're talking about something new mm -hmm. um i think the um, so they can see who your trustees are online exactly yeah. so it, it just takes some complexity out of your process mm. 
Yeah, good point. But certainly, you, don't, you certainly don't need a bank account to register a CIO, because I know from personal experience, we registered our CIO, CIO without a bank account in place for that CIO. We had the bank account for the preview, the sort of pre mm, predecessor the church. church. Yeah. Okay, at the moment, that looks like the end of the questions. But um, thank you, Penny, and thank you, Bearwood Baptist Church. I don't know the person behind. Oh, there's Penny. It says thank you, very helpful. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for everybody who's listened in today. Uh, as Caroline said uh, right back at the beginning, this uh, webinar is being recorded. Uh, so you can currently, if you want to go back and listen again right now, I believe you can scroll back to the beginning on YouTube and uh, and play again. Uh, if not, uh, it will be posted as a full recording on our website uh, probably next week. Uh, we, we do endeavor to get them up reasonably quickly, but on this YouTube link, you should be able to find it uh straight away uh and if you do have any questions that uh, occur to you later uh please do get in touch via legal.ops at baptist.org.uk and uh, as caroline says and is on screen at the moment but uh, thank you very much for joining us hope you found that very uh, useful uh, uh refresher if it was the first uh, it was a ref refresh or useful first time introduction to cios and as caroline says if you want to learn more about the topic then book on to one of the half day sessions uh organized uh with caroline's team and uh and anthony collins mm -hmm. so thank you very much and uh, thank you caroline it's been uh, very helpful and uh look forward to uh, uh uh supporting you all through this process if you choose to go that way mm -hmm. thanks very much cheers bye bye now